slow down. Grab the wall, wiggle like you're trying to make your ass fall off. Hella thick, I wanna smash them all now. Speed up, gas pedal, gas pedal, gas pedal, gas pedal, gas pedal. Gas pedal. You already need me. Please allow me to begin by greeting the Sweetie Squad. Hello, you glorious bastards. How have you been? Have you bought any new hats? It has been brought to my attention that the original is still selling quite a few hats. Do you own one of his hats that you specifically sought out? Put the details in the comment section below. Stay put, though. We're about to delve into the intricate web of words, their meanings, and the social sensitivity that surrounds them. In a surprising turn of events, this year's Halloween, normally a time for ghosts, goblins, and harmless scares, has become a linguistic minefield. In our age of enlightenment and equality, even words as innocuous as spook and spooky can spark heated debates. The cultural sensitivity and historical background of these expressions are the main topics of these talks. Let's try our hand at deciphering this language puzzle, shall we? The controversy may be traced back to a single post written during the spooky month of October, a tweet that banned the use of a word because of the hurtful associations people have with its past. If you ever get the sudden impulse to do something daring, you know right where to go to stoke the flames of linguistic debates. Twitter. What a ride, right? But why can a word that sounds so simple on the surface have such heavy connotations? In the instance of the word spook, there is a part of its roots that can be traced back to the murky times of World War II. It was a pejorative word that the Germans used to refer to black pilots, and its intention was to degrade and demean those individuals. Fast forward to the 1950s in the United States, when a small group of people gave new life to this phrase, ensuring that its negative implications would continue to be spread. However, as the years passed, the term spook was used less frequently in this context, and it eventually became a remnant of a time when prejudice was more prevalent. That is how it appeared. Here we are in the present day. An atmosphere of heightened vigilance has developed in recent years as a result of a recent uptick in social awareness and a growing desire to fight prejudice. The words spook and spooky have all of a sudden been exhumed from the linguistic graveyard and forced into the limelight. The use of these terms to communicate a sense of spookiness or humor has been clouded by historical prejudice, despite the fact that this was the original aim behind their use. And with that, the linguistic conflict got underway. However, why should we care about this so much? Why do some people argue that they should have the right to use these words in a way that is not hurtful, while others argue that they should be allowed to keep them in the dictionary? The answer is in one's own perspective and or interpretation of the circumstance at hand in order to find a solution. These words for some people conjure up thoughts of oppression and prejudice and bring back memories of a tough time in the past. Others have the opinion that these descriptions are worthless because they are not encumbered with the historical baggage that is linked with them. When meaning and intent go to war, who comes out on top? Should words carry the stigma of their first use forever, no matter how harmless the subsequent usage is? Should they be allowed to shed their bleak past like old snakeskins, or should they be prevented from progressing? The debate rages on, and in the thick of it, the voices of those who have been legitimately impacted by these statements are sometimes missed in the noise. The problem is made more difficult by the insistence on personal responsibility. If people truly care about making the world a safer place for those who are excluded, they will listen, seek out information, and adjust their language accordingly. When does legitimate concern become an attempt to censor how others express themselves? How much censorship of speech is appropriate, especially when the speaker has no malicious intent? There is a high possibility of unintentionally stifling free expression in an effort to promote inclusiveness. Fear of making a social faux pas or unintentionally hurting someone's feelings looms large over conversations. Open communication is threatened in such an environment, giving way to fear and self-censorship instead. The tone of an insult might be considerably different from that of pleasant conversation, which is typically lighter. You need to know what to do next, right? 
The key, sweeties, is to find a happy medium. It's vital to consider not only the context in which words are now being used, but also their historical meaning. The target culture will be one in which free expression is valued and where people feel safe, speaking their minds without fear of retaliation. Each word adds to the magnificent fabric of the human experience that is language. As custodians, it is our duty to handle the individual strings of this priceless work of art with the utmost respect. To remember the past without letting it hold one back in the present. To train ourselves to listen carefully. To learn new things. To develop as people. And to review our language periodically. To make sure it accurately reflects the progress we've made. Until we meet again, sweeties, please keep things spooky.